again. We'll call the February 6th Calabrese Council of Governments uh, regular meeting to order. If you'll please stand while we have the Pledge of Allegiance. First item is the consent agenda. Consent agenda items are expected to be routine and non-controversial and will be acted upon by the council at one time without discussion. Any council member, staff member, or interested party may request that an item be removed from the consent agenda for further discussion. Do we have any consent agenda items being wished to be pulled? I'm public. Seeing none, we have consent agenda items one, two, three, four, five, six, A, B, and C. Do we have a motion to approve that? So moved. Second. Moved by Council Member Unities, seconded by Council Member Fondard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Approve 7 0. <clears throat> Regular agenda item number 7. Public comment. Public comment shall be limited to five minutes per person and limited to items that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council and not on the posted agenda. Do we have any public comment this evening? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move to item number eight. Item number eight, I'm going to allow Ms. Collins to uh, take this agenda item. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this, the February 6th marks the first uh, meeting of the calendar year 2019. Um, as part of the new calendar year protocol, the chair is appointed by the council members. Um, the chair will serve also as the chair for the Calaveras Transit Agency, and they also serve on the executive management group, um, which meets about quarterly to review um, administrative personnel and financial um, issues of the COG. And so I will hand it over um, to the board for discussion. and appointment of the chair. Well, I'll talk. Um, I would like to make a m motion and nominate Gay for chair for 2019. I'm sorry, who? Gay. Jeff Friday the second, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Saved by the numbers, huh? I apologize, I couldn't hear the motion. The motion from Amanda is to have Gary Tocanelli be the board chair for the coming year. I'm looking at Gary wondering if he's going to hit me if I give a second. You can second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor of having Mr. Tocanelli be our board chair this year? Aye. 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 Put that in Hand over your gavel back. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, but this is Jack's gavel. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta bring your own. <laughs> All right, well, I wanna thank the board. Um, hopefully, um, I live through the year. <laughs> and moving on, we're going to item number nine. Amber, you wanna? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, this item is appointment of the vice chair for calendar year 2019. And again, the vice chair will serve as a vice chair of the Calvary Transit Agency and on the executive management group as well. And I'll hand it over to the board. And chair, I would move Amanda Follendorf to be the vice chair. I have second. a motion for Amanda for vice chair. Second. We have a second. Any other discussion? If not, call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 7-0. And I always take a minute before we go into 10. I want to thank John um, for his uh, service as chair. I think three years. Mm -hmm. Three years. Uh, thank you very much. You did an excellent job. Well, thank you. You did very well. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure having you as chair coming here. In the, at least okay. for the last two years. Well, I've been, so. well, it'd be fun to be still just a regular member as well. So. <laughs> thank you. All right. Moving on. Item number 10. Presentation by Richardson and Company with request for acceptance by the Council for a fiscal year 2017-18 Annual Transportation Development Act, the TDA. 
financial audit for Calaveras Transit, the City of Angels, non streets, transit streets, and roads audit. And I, is the auditor anybody Mr. Chair, here? Um, Brian uh, Nash couldn't make it from Richardson and Company. Um, I'll do my best to present the two audits. I've also asked Rebecca Callen, the auditor controller from the county, um, to be here. If we had any additional questions? Would you like me to proceed? Yes, go ahead. Proceed. Okay. So the two audits are the Calaveras Transit Agency audit. If you want to take a look at page, packet page 68 and then audit page number four. This page identifies the operating expenses. They total the 1.331098. And before I start, I just wanted to let you know that the management is responsible for um, preparing the financial statements, and it's the outside auditors responsible under the generally, generally accepted auditing standards to provide an opinion. Um, below the operating costs, you have the non-operating revenue. Outline the LTF, STA, the state grants, other revenue, um, the other revenue that is advertising. State grants consists of the state, um, uh, state of good repair and the LC top. If you want to go to packet page number 77 and audit page number 13. This identifies that the transit system achieved the fare box recovery ratio. They achieved 10.39. If you see how they break down, they identified the revenue, then you can withdraw the exclusions. Um, on the very next page, packet page 78, it identifies that even though the fare box recovery ratio was met this year, it's because we didn't meet it the two previous years, this is the penalty year. So the penalty is the 4,139. So the CTA will be responsible for paying the penalty amount. Mm -hmm. You want to take a look at packet, package page 82, um, audit page 17. This identifies any findings. This year there were no findings and then it um, outlines the previous year's findings. Any council questions? Or? No? Okay. Um, if you go back to page, packet page 68, um, I just wanted to identify depreciation increased by 16,000. Uh, from the previous year, um, one of the, or two of the possible reasons were, you know, we purchased multiple buses, so you have the depreciation on those, and then we had the completion of two PTMISCA um, capital projects and the Cal OES projects. And just in following up that, uh, part of getting transit wrapped up in order to transition it over was to really um, go through all of the open projects that were out there and identify if they were completed, um, if they needed to be disallowed, et cetera. We had a significant number of CIP projects that just kept carrying over year after year after year. So we worked very closely with the Council of Governments um, in order to identify which ones we could just close out. And the moment we were able to close them out is the moment we actually start to be able to depreciate. So that actually was very helpful. And that Good job. Yeah. Well, thank you to the county auditor staff. Um, this year, um, we really relied on them to get this audit complete. Um, in the previous years, we've been presenting this audit to the council in April. Um, so this year was a real push. We were able to get COG done in December, and then these two in February. Yeah. Thank so, you. Um, I, I, your staff. Thank yeah, you. yeah, and uh, so I just, I really appreciate, you know, my office and being able to, to get this done and working very collaboratively with the COG um, to kind of get this transition
kind of closed out and finished and kind of tie up some loose ends. Um, we put uh, a, a lot of things in place um, and, a, and a lot better communication. And I'm really looking forward to this transition uh, working out and having transit be a, a very strong priority for the county and the city overall. Questions? And you. on, thank you, Rebecca. On the city audit, this is the excess LTF streets and roads. So um, they, all the Richardson and Company had to do was test the TDA expenses and found no issues to report. Um, the audit for transit is considered clean. And if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. <laughs> Compared to previous years and even a couple of years ago, this is a great audit. Thank you. Yeah. Very good job. Very good. Yes, yes. Janice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, in comparison to two years ago, this is a, a major shift in, in how things are working. And uh, I see there is more collaboration than there has been in the past, mm -hmm. which is very helpful. And to know that you're 60 days ahead of the curve of what we had previously yeah. also speaks to how things are working between the various agencies. So uh, I very much appreciate the no findings report uh, on this issue. That, that means that all of the work that's been done even in-house within COG has, uh, has helped as well. It's um, so. been, yeah, I, I, I had hopes that um, this would happen very quickly, but you just never know when transitions occur, and we were very happy with the, the abilities on both sides and the collaboration. Um, and ultimately, this is how it's supposed to go. So um, the, these, this has always been my expectation all, all the way back, so I'm, I'm pleased for the change and I'm looking forward to the same going forward. My only other additional comment is 10.39% is only 0.39% over the threshold. It, it and is. And so that creates issues yeah. if we have additional expending or obligations that occur in this next 12 months, uh, it could easily push us under. So right. I just want everybody to be uh, cognizant of uh, that is a very tight spot to be in for it, us. It, yeah. it is a tight spot, and you have to also take into consideration part of the factors that allowed that to happen um, was the additional depreciation expenses and also LC Top. Um, LC Top was, in essence, utilized to mimic uh, fares, fare revenue. Mm -hmm. So that is, um, you know, it's it's not exactly fares, but it, it does give us the allowance to use it that way. So those two factors really play into us being able to, to, to meet that number. So it's definitely something to keep into consideration. Operational points are gonna to have to take that into consideration. And to write down those depreciation numbers just this one time, that's a one-time yeah. thing. And that's what we need to keep in mind as well. This is this not an ongoing expense? Yeah, and on so. the expense side, um, the dedicated staff person in the Public Works Department retired in that September. So they didn't incur salaries yeah, and right. benefits throughout the year. And then they were also able to exclude, you know, new extension routes that were eligible Correct. during those years, which are not going to be eligible in the coming years. Right. So we have to really look at how we're going to use, you know, the LC top, the state of good repair, um, you know, what changes and routes we're going to do. And um, in the previous year, I, I think you'll remember uh, the surplus funding mm -hmm. was also included to try to hit, hit the fare box. And you usually don't want to depend on that on an annual basis, but we're in the middle of that. And we're trying to surplus some stuff right now at the CTA to try to help that. I certainly do appreciate the focus. Thank you, yep. Rebecca. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none. Public comments, questions? item? No? All right. Moving on to item number 11. This is a designation of a voting delegate on the California Association of Councils of Governments, CALCOG, Governing Council. <coughs> it was supposed to be a I just asked for their acceptance. The audits. Gary, can I, I just need your guys' acceptance to to submit those two Oh, it, yeah, it was that uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So we're looking for a motion? So moved. Second. Second. 
<coughs> I thought it was informational, but yeah, I guess yeah. we have to accept the audit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have a motion and a second. Any other conversations? No? Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, moving on again to item number 11, designation of the voting delegate on the California Association of Councils of Government, CALCOG, Governing Council. And um, Amber, it says presented by you. Yes, I'll take the item. Uh, the Calaveras COG is a member of the California Association of Council of Governments, which is comprised of 46 members who are Council of Governments, Regional Transportation Planning Agencies, local transportation commissions and metropolitan transportation planning organizations, all the acronym soup of regional transportation planning agencies in California. Um, the organization addresses regional issues such as transportation, air quality, financial, housing, environmental, economic, and related uh, regional topics. Um, each me member organization of the California S Association of COGS appoints a representative to serve on the CalCOG board as a voting delegate. Um, this delegate will represent the COG at the annual CalCOG conference along with myself, um, the executive director. Um, and there are typically three CalCOG board meetings. Um, one is at the annual conference and then one in the spring and the fall. Um, and they typically provide a call-in option. Um, historically, this has been the chair of the COG, but it is at the discretion of the board. So I'm looking for um, action on appointing a delegate to the CalCOG board. Um, as well as your approval of that delegate to attend the uh, CalCOG Regional Forum this year in March. Well, Chair, I would be interested to know if Mr. Gomes would like to continue to represent on this next meeting just simply because of the level of understanding you have of what's going on and... I, I appreciate that, but actually I would recommend uh, our Chair be the attending member of our, our Council. Um, it's an outstanding conference as far as the information provided on a statewide level. Uh, this one is a changed uh, format. It used to be three days from Wednesday to Friday down in Monterey. This year they've, they've moved it down to Yosemite, which is interesting to do in March, but they're gonna, they've done so. Uh, and it's going from Thursday through Sunday. Um, it's a, a, a conference where you're gonna meet all the other regional um, council chairs, a conference where you'll also meet a lot of the other executive directors as well as some legislative members um, from the state. The preparation that is done, the materials presented have always been very forward thinking. Um, and inevitably, I have found that what I have picked up at that conference has benefited both me in understanding where the state is trying to go, but also understanding some of the alphabet soup and acronyms that are coming and why they're coming from the state with Caltrans and the California Transportation Commission. So, I would recommend it. I think it's an outstanding conference, and I would recommend that our chair be the attending member. I, I defer to your Thank advice. Thank you. Um, how about we name you as an alternate? So I don't have my calendar in front of me right okay. now. Um, it looks like I'm open just by thinking about what it is. It looks like I'm open, but, but I don't know what I have coming up on other issues but yeah other issues so if we at least name you as an alternate we, we have somebody that has experience going there i was actually going to ask that the vice chair, chair i would, would agree with elected, that i would ask that the vice chair go i was gonna i like the idea of an alternate i think uh, the vice chair would be appropriate uh, just to learn and see exactly what's Please. going on i think it would be a great experience for you would you like uh, a motion is that a motion i would move that our uh our chair or his designee uh, would be the attending member from the Calabrese Council of Governments, but that would definitely have a member attend. Second. Third. <laughs> I have a motion and two seconds. <laughs> Actually, a little less than two minutes. Any public comment on this item? Seeing none, bring it back any further council conversations. If not, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Didn't vote. Yeah, we'll just, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Move on to item one more thing to add to the calendar. <laughs> I know. I mean, That's fine. No problem. 
Minute, the number 12 is the minute order adopting a fiscal year 2019-2020 supplemental call for project guidelines for regional service transportation program, the RSTP, and highway infrastructure program, the HIP funds, and issue call for projects. Amber? Yes. You? Yep, I'll take this item. Um, approximately every three to four years, the COG approves state and federal funding uh, for city and county projects through what we call a COG for projects, um, which is a process that is, um, allows us to be transparent in programming funding for the city and county and also allows us to program funding that aligns with our regional um, priorities here at the COG. Um, we most recently had a cycle, a call for projects completed in 2018. Um, which covered fiscal years 18, 19 to 21, 22. Um, this I'm calling a supplemental call for projects um, because we are getting uh, approximately $1.2 million in regional surface transportation program funding um, back from a loan that we provided to the Metropolitan Transportation uh, Commission so as to not um, lapse funding. Um, so this funding needs to be programmed by fed federal fiscal year um, 1920, which is why we need to conduct the process right now. Um, the other funding that became available is Highway Infrastructure Program funding. Um, this is a new funding source is actually uh, provided through the Federal DOT Appropriations Act, and it's actually general fund money, um, not highway trust fund money. So um, right now it's one-time funding, um, and it needs to be programmed by <coughs> fiscal year uh, 2021 so we thought this was a good opportunity to incorporate in this call for projects as well uh, so the TAC the technical advisory committee of the COG which consists of um, city and county staff Caltrans staff um, and and COG staff um, are the ones to review the project applications and develop a recommendation of projects for funding um, from these revenues available um, this requires local jurisdiction board resolutions for the projects brought forward um, for the TAC to review and approve. Um, attached to the staff report are the draft guidelines for this call, including the fund estimate, the schedule, project evaluation ground rules, timely use of funds policy, and the project nomination application. Um, so the TAC, they've reviewed these guidelines and recommending um, or requesting the COG to release the call for projects. Um, we have applications due on May 3rd, and then we have three TAC meetings we have scheduled um, to work through uh, the process with the TAC, but if the TAC is ready after one or two TAC meetings, we might bring a program recommendation to you earlier than August. And so I'm happy to answer any questions. So it could be earlier than the August 7th is on the schedule. Correct. Any questions? Well, quite obviously then, um, to the TAC has worked through the details and know that there's enough deliverables out there that make this worthwhile to go in this direction. Correct, yes, I've, you know, we've talked at the TAC and I believe, um, I know that the county with uh, the new public works director has reviewed um, the county CIP and doing a lot of work in that area as well as the new city administrator. So I think um, that we have quite a few projects that we can pull from um, that are getting near to ready for completion. And the, and the uh, money that we loaned out will be back and available to us when? In 1920. 1920. So next fiscal year. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Any public comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gary Caldwell, Valley Springs. Um, one of the things with these uh, federal programs, sometimes the deadlines sort of creep up on you and you don't realize they're coming. And sometimes you miss the funding availability. And the one uh, program was uh, identified that is off of the highway uh, trust fund budget, uh, has got some uh, money apparently in it. I don't know what the restrictions are, but, um, I would suggest that the council give consideration to projects that would add bike lanes to uh, many of your collector roads. Uh, I can remember doing a bike lane project on Highway 88 and 
turns out that there weren't a lot of bicycles used it, but it gave three year, it gave four more feet of pavement to the motorists going through there in the wintertime. Sometimes they could use it. So my recommendation is that you um, act first on the the uh, funding that is off the uh, budget, the Federal Highway Trust Fund budget, to get that out of the way because what's going to happen is it's not going to come very often. And so you need to take advantage of that. Uh, the other thing I was going to suggest is that you uh, identify, I see it says TAC meetings on certain dates here. Where are those TAC meetings held and what time? held at the COG offices, generally about at the COG office, generally oh. about 10 a.m. in the morning. 10 a.m. in the morning? So if looking at this listing of meeting dates of TAC, we can assume that it's going to be 10 o'clock in the morning at the COG office. Will there be agendas or information set out in advance of that? There okay. I'd like to be put on the mailing list, please. Okay. Well, so noted. And uh, please don't let the funding availability passed by. I know the last time uh, we had a, a federal uh, program available to the counties and cities in California and all other states, uh, there were some cities and counties who just let the money lapse. They didn't even apply for it. A lot of them did with the ARA funds too back when ARA. Our bigger pardon? The ARA funds, they did the same thing when that was going That was the one I was referring yeah, to. The ARA funds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other public comments? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. This is a minute order, so we are looking for a motion. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any other conversation? Questions? No? Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> no. Pass it seven zero. Moving on to item number thirteen. This is a resolution number fiscal year nineteen through seventeen, authorizing a temporary loan of up to four hundred thousand from the local transportation fund or LTF funds to the Calaveras Transit Agency, the CTA operating fund. Amber, this is you. Um, I think it's Melissa. Melissa. Oh, Melissa, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I Amber on here, but I guess I didn't. No, you're right. <laughs> um, during the JPA transition period, one of the compliance issues identified um, was the county's ineligibility in the FTA, or Federal Transit Administration Program. Um, that fiscal year, the 2017-18 apportionment uh, total 250000 and in an effort to not lose that 250000 in federal funds and to pre preserve local funds, um, the JPA directed staff to work with FTA to try to carry that so that the CTA would be able to utilize it. So staff was successful in doing so, and as reflected in the CTA's operations budget, um, you see the $512,000. Um, as I stated in my staff report, there was an operational reserve that the council approved in June, and this was to cover expenses until the invoicing and reimbursement on this funding would be realized. Well, with the government shutdown, um, the schedule has pretty much been blown out of the water. Um, the process hasn't even started. Like I stated in the um, staff report, we haven't executed a standard agreement. Um, therefore, staff is recommending a temporary loan in the amount up to $400,000. Um, in that recommendation, I consulted with the county auditor controller, and I actually, the note in this whole staff report is a template after what the county has done in the past. So, I've included, oh, go ahead. No, I just. Go, go ahead, Mr. Okay, thing. so yeah, I've included, finish. you know, some of the back, um, background documents or background documents is we did a cash flow analysis. So you can see, you see the 628,000 in August and how we're receiving the revenue. You know, a majority of our revenue is received on a monthly or quarterly basis. Right. 
So we anticipated, you know, with the end of December, we would have already submitted an invoice to FTA for that first half of the year, and, and we would be awaiting reimbursement. Um, and we would have gone through this. So if you look at the bottom of the chart, so when it is read on the very bottom where it says the closing cash balance, that's when the fund would go in the red. If you see red on the cash flow um, in the middle, that's just the monthly basis, like the revenue you received in the month, you know, minus the expenditures. Um, going into the new fiscal year, we usually approve claims for the CTA in June, and then we can start you know, transferring the claims, but as I said in the staff report, LTF comes in on a monthly basis, and until it is received, you, you can't transfer it to the CTA, and then STA is received on a quarterly basis. So we, to date, only received in December our first quarter STA. Does council have any questions? I'd be happy to ask Councilman Mills. Yes, uh, thank you. Question would be, what is your expected duration that you're looking at on this loan? Well, you're thinking six months or? Better? Well, we're, worst case scenario, we called our neighbors, we reached out to Tuolumne County to see when they typically, and we are forecasting we would receive the reimbursement until December of 2019. And like I said, that's worst case scenario. You know, the government has reopened, but there is the threat of it shutting down again. Um, and I appreciate the honesty because yeah. that's, we really need to know what that window is. That and then the other part is, is that our, is the interest gonna be uh, levied at the pooled uh, money rate or is there some yes. other? Yes, I identified the pooled uh, money rate and the county auditor controller would calculate that and give me the a dollar amount and then it would be transferred back. Okay. So, you know, when you look back at should we have still gone after that apportionment, you know, that the county would have lost, I would say yes. In the effort to secure or keep as many LTF funding, you know, as possible, right now we're in a timing thing. You know, we're still scheduled to get the, L the FTA funding and then we'll free up the LTF and make that available to the local What would happen if this didn't get approved? Um, as you can see, it would be May and June till the fund would go negative. Um, you know, I think this council has seen that in the past. Um, I wanted to be proactive, uh, transparent, um, air the issues that I think we'll be seeing based on this program. Um, I don't know if the council is fine with it going into the negative. I don't think the auditor controller would be very happy with that. So. No, no, no. <laughs> Any other questions? Any public questions? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council for a motion. Or so anything? moved. I have a motion, do I have a second? <clears throat> Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7 0. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Moving on to item number 14, Caltrans report. This is a verbal report, no supplemental materials included. And I see Caltrans is here. Good evening, members of the board. I'm Gregoria Ponce, Caltrans District 10. And I have very few February items. I'll be open with the first one. At this time, Caltrans, we're addressing all the extreme weather road conditions events. So you may see us out there um, um, doing what we need to do. That right now is our primary focus in terms of safety and addressing uh, extreme uh, weather conditions. My second item up is in terms of the overall work program on grant items. We're moving forward for all invoices, for, so thank you for reporting and bringing those forward. Um, and in terms of the overall work program with uh, a quarterly detail in terms of um, products or reporting items, uh, we did get those as well, and we're moving forward with those. So with that, I don't have any other items to report. Does the board have any questions for me? 
Any questions from the council? Well, just, just a thought, uh, because I did see the update on the SB1 funding that you sent out from District 10. Uh, that has to do with State Route 49 in Mariposa County and and the uh, culvert or drainage system project in San Joaquin. And I think uh, Alpine was in that, involved in that as well. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to participate sometime in the future in some of that SB1 money that they're looking at there. Those are big projects, big projects. And I'd like to also thank Caltrans for their uh, enormous heavy lift during the, the storms that we've had, not only the snow, but the rain, the ice, et cetera. Uh, if you look at our accident rate in the last 48 hours, it is substantially lower than it would normally be for these kind of events. So it, it has something to do with your crews and the work that they've done on our highways to keep everybody safe. And I want to thank you for it. Thank you. Any other comments? No, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Gary Caldwell once again. Um, I want to pay a compliment to uh, Caltrans. Um, my wife and I drive northerly on Highway 49 across the McCollamy there and we go down the canyon and for months there was a stretch of guardrail there, oh I don't know, 75, 80 feet long, that was damaged and it was just sitting there. Nobody was repairing it. And of course being an ex-highway engineer, I got upset because that wasn't being repaired. So we were at um, the meeting of uh, the group that's doing the study for downtown Valley Springs. And a gentleman there, and I thought it was a Caltrans rep, turns out he was a consultant. And I was mumbling about the fact that Caltrans hasn't done anything to repair it. And uh, so he said, well, I know the maintenance superintendent there or supervisor whatever he said i'll speak to her. i think it's a woman i'll speak to her okay and in about three weeks it was done so i wrote an email to the deputy director in charge of planning district 10 saying that i appreciate so and so helping get that fixed and uh, and how quickly he had it done so forth he wrote back and said he's not one of ours <laughs> he's a consultant and so i Sorry, it doesn't matter whether it's a consultant or a Caltrans person, but it got done. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate Caltrans getting on that once, sir. Of course, you wonder how can they not be made aware of it? They got to drive that road every once in a while. Um, once they were maybe pushed by the deputy director to get it done, they took care of it. Thank you. Any other public comments on Caltrans? Not. We'll move on to item number 15. This is a county quarterly report. Good evening, Chair and members of the board. My name is Joshua Pack. I'm the Director of Public Works and Transportation for Calaveras County. Uh, if you're looking, if you're following at home on sheet 15A, there's a series of programs and projects identified in the Capital Improvement Program. I have updates for about five or six of these and some other uh, tidbits to share with you today. Um, the county roadway sign retro reflectivity upgrade, that's an RSTP funded project in fiscal year 1718. Uh, the county in parallel applied for a highway safety improvement program grant funds for cycle nine for a, um, a retro reflectivity project on about 200 miles or so of road. The county found out in December that we were successful in that grant funding. And on top of that, uh, we're funded essentially 100% of that funding through that federal grant program. So. Moving forward, I'll be working with our uh, COG counterparts to um, potentially deobligate that project and look for um, other opportunities for that funding. Uh, that's a great opportunity when we can take um, some of the discretionary RSTP funding and looking to apply that to other projects locally and do some of these projects with federal grants. So that's a great win for us. Um, that project will um, uh, begin here in the coming months and will probably, that's about a two year project on average. Um, uh, I've done two of those. As a matter of fact, I was the first county in the state of California to deliver one about two, three years ago. Um, they're a little more difficult than it sounds, but uh, I know how to get through that. We'll be uh, probably delivering that hopefully in uh, calendar year 2021. 
Uh, moving on here, the next one I have an update for is O'Burns Ferry Left Turn Pocket. Um, again, this is one of our projects that's been on the books for a little bit. I know I've been working closely with Supervisor Mills as is in his um, uh, 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 district. Uh, so that project, we also applied for a Highway Safety Improvement Program grant funding opportunity. Unfortunately, that one was not funded. So um, that one has a funding gap right now. Um, however, um, we have rescoped the project. We're working with a consultant to um, significantly reduce the size and scope of that project to get it more in line with expectations and with available funding. Uh, that effort should be done within the next month or two, and then um, we'll have a better idea of our funding gap and opportunities to close that gap. Um, I'm confident we'll deliver that by 2020, and that's how I programmed it in the county um, capital improvement program. However, um, for folks who are getting to know me, I like to push projects, and so I'm looking for opportunities to fund that uh, in, in potentially in 2019, depending on the available funding sources. Uh, the next project is the Pine Street West Point bike path. Um, uh, this is an interesting one. As you can see on our list, um, it is the oldest of our projects. Uh, that's not a distinguish, um, distinguishment that I look at positively. So um, I've been working with staff. Um, this is an interesting one where it's scoped in different ways. Um, it's called bike path on this list. It's called bike lane in our program and actually in the bikeway and trail master plan It's a bike way. So it <laughs> we're not going to install three at the same time um, So we're looking at doing a bike way. I think that's appropriate for the community in which it's in so um, uh, I think we can do that within or close to that hundred and twenty thousand dollars authorized for construction so our staffs working on a um, design plan right now um, depending on uh, the preliminary cost we may look to deliver that this year or due to its small size, we may try to combine this with another project either this year or next year. But either way, um, we're marching forward to delivery of that, um, hopefully this year, no later than 2020 for sure. Uh, the next project I'll talk about is the State Route 4 Wagon Trail realignment. Um, as you can see, the predominant amount of funding is identified to this project. Um, Amber and I have been working closely with our counterparts at Caltrans to move this project forward. Fortunately, about three weeks ago, I believe, or two weeks ago, we received authorization from FHWA and Caltrans to move forward with the project. It had been stuck in a limbo for the last uh, number of months um, regarding the right-of-way and preliminary right-of-way phase. So we were able to unbreak that, um, that cog, uh, no pun intended, and move forward with the project. So we met with uh, Caltrans staff yesterday uh, for a project kickoff for the right-of-way phase. Uh, that meeting went well, and our consultants are already moving forward with some of the preliminary work that's necessary to move forward with that purchase, including trying to get rights to move on to properties to do geotechnical studies, um, right-of-way analysis surveys for that. Um, and so um, uh, we're moving forward with that one. Um, we have a pretty aggressive timeline with the uh, funding on that, in particular with some shop set-aside funding uh, uh, that needs to be delivered. Uh, so we've, we think um, we can get our work done and we need to push not only ourselves but also Caltrans to make sure their reviews are done in a timely manner. So um, we're working aggressively to that and I've tasked my consultant not only to keep the hammer on Caltrans but to keep the hammer on us. So to make sure we're not lagging in any of our reviews. Uh, finally, the last one I'll talk about in a little bit of length today is the State Route 49 Mountain Ranch Improvement Project. Uh, this one also has a myriad of funding sources dating back to fiscal year 10-11. Um, I've been working closely with Supervisor Tofanelli on that project. Again, an opportunity to rescope that. This project had been mired in some environmental cultural resources concerns. I think through an appropriate rescope, we can eliminate or significantly reduce those impacts, um, resulting in a much smaller um, or much less, uh, much fewer impacts on the CEQA side and NEPA side. So uh, my goal and my plan, uh, and I have committed to delivering this by no later than uh, 2020. Uh, uh, we, this will include a realignment of, uh, of Pope and Mountain Ranch improvements from the Government Center uh, driveway all the way down to State Route 49 and an improvement of the sidewalk there. A lot of that is an ADA accessible, so making sure that's an improvement. Uh, also improving bike accessibility, uh, providing a marked crosswalk uh, to link the uh, hospital over with the Government Center is also a part of that project. So excited to work on that, um, hopefully have that under construction in 2020. Uh, I don't have an update for you today on Valley Springs. I did call my counterpart in the planning department to get an update. Unfortunately, he was busy today and couldn't get back to me. But if there are any needs on this board for an update, I can provide those offline um, after this date. And the last thing I want to bring you up to date with is um, uh, as part of my time here, I've only been here three and a half months, but uh, in January, with the help of my staff, my incredible staff, 
we were able to present a county-wide capital improvement uh, program draft to the board. Uh, I've been working with board members on feedback for that and we'll be presenting a final adoption of that document which includes about 37 projects including a number of these in here. Uh, the goal of that is to, um, it's, it's tough to move forward without having a plan. And so uh, in the past, uh, we haven't done the best job of um, uh, um, articulating that plan with the public and with the board. And so um, this is our first effort in a, in a lot of years to do that. I think it's a thoughtful and intelligent plan uh, to move forward with our resources and looking forward to enact that. Uh, and again, a lot of these projects uh, are driven through that document as well. And I think there's some synergy between uh, the COG CIP and our CIP. So with that said, it's a little longer uh, update than normal, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about these or other projects. Thank you. Josh, don't leave. I'm uh, not. <laughs> I, need to talk, I need to talk to you before you go over today, uh, tonight. Uh, on a State Route 4 also, I know that COG has been working really hard to try to find additional funding sources. We now have Mia O'Connell engaged in it. Um, and there are opportunities and options that we'll, we'll continue to search out, and I know that you're involved in that as well. So uh, this isn't just about what phase we're in, but how do we ensure that we've got the funding necessary when the time comes? The Gantt charts out, and I know it's very aggressive, but it's been languishing for so many years. So yeah. I'm just glad to see that uh, we're picking up the ball again and running with it. Yeah. I appreciate your effort. Yeah, and to speak on that, um, uh, the, uh, both Amber and I have been involved with downloads from the federal government on the grant opportunities we went after and were not successful in both infra and build uh, grants. So I think Amber was on a call with Mia on the infra program and provided a download. Uh, we'll be on next Monday, I believe, um, with Mia and you on the build grant. And the opportunities for these are when you're not successful for grants, um, having the opportunity to talk to the federal government and hearing where you were perhaps lap, uh, you know, a little bit behind or, or, or um, a little bit short in their eyes really um, educates us and allows us to mature in the process uh, so that we can provide a better, um, a better grant opportunity in subsequent cycles. I think there's also a little bit of guilt on their side that if they keep talking to us, you know, it might make them a little more um, uh, sympathetic to our cause. So I think it's a, it's a worthwhile effort uh, to engage with them. And again, we become more educated and um, more mature in that process as well. Any other council questions? Yes. Uh, I want to start first by saying thank you for all the work Public Works is doing also with the current weather. Uh, we know it's hard up the hill. Last year I'd asked about some lights in San Andreas, not the high overhead, but the decorative lights that PG&E installed as part of the underground wiring project. Mm -hmm. It got first looked into by Caltrans, who referred us back to the County Public Works Department. A gentleman named Steve from your department responded and said that PG&E was doing a high um, our high efficiency lighting project and they were supposed to replace those lights in addition or separate from the, the overhead lights but the decorative lights as well. With pg &E's bankruptcy, I don't know if that should be revisited to see if they're actually going to continue that project or not, but right now there's at least half a dozen or more of the decorative lights that you normally would use in San Andreas as you're walking down the streets that are out and have been out for months. Okay. Are those on, um, if you don't mind me following St up, uh, uh, on, are they St. on, how what's that? On St. Charles Highway. On St. Charles Avenue. Okay. Uh, well, I could certainly do some research to find out what's going on with those, um, whose responsibility they are. If they're the counties, uh, we could certainly make the repairs to that for those ones that are currently out. Uh, and if they're Caltrans or others, I mean, uh, whether it's a new or expanding is one thing, but uh, repairing uh, lights that are out and making sure their work is not part of a pg &E thing. That's part of the day-to-day -day duties. And there's great liability in not making sure those are up to date. Right. So uh, I'll follow up with that. Um, like I said, the, the response had specifically been from Caltrans that it was the county's responsibility. And Steve from your department specifically right. said that he was reaching back out to pg &E with their high efficiency lighting program to get them done. Gotcha. Uh, let me follow up and then I'll circle around with you at a later date. Let me know what I can, I'll let you know what I can find out. Thanks. Give me a few days or maybe a week. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Any public questions? Any none? Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Moving on to item number 16, the city quarterly report. And I see one of the M&M &M girls is here. <laughs> Back again. Thank you, Melissa Eads, City of Angels. And I do have some updates on the projects that we have identified on our CIP. And I have to apologize because I think last time I was here, I committed to 
updating and populating this information more frequently. And unfortunately, uh, my staff person responsible for that has taken a new position. So I am actively recruiting and here to update you um, myself with this information. So first, um, the State Route 49 sidewalk uh, project and bike lane project. We have environmental clearance as of December 2019, which is exciting. Um, we have final plans underway and right of way is scheduled for spring 2019. And I believe this is the one that we recently just received a CTC allocation in January for right of way. So we are on track with that project. The Angels Camp Trails project, we are in environmental and progress is underway. We anticipate completion of environmental in spring of 2020. We have stakeholder meetings that will begin this spring 2019. The Murphy's Grade Road project is in a really good place with environmental clearance also. Um, December 2018, I'm sorry on State Route 4, I think I said December 2019. I meant December 2018, we're there, we've done it. Uh, but Murphy's Grade Road also environmentally cleared December 2018. We have done our property owner outreach, that is complete. The plans for this project are at 65% and we applied for an active transportation grant, but we were very close but not successful. I think we scored an 84 with the lowest score being funded in 85. So we are committed to going back after ATP. But um, having gotten so project ready on Murphy's Grade Road, we are looking for construction funding because I don't believe we have any construction funding identified on this project other than the RSTP that you see there. And I believe the estimates are coming in about two million for that project. So um, we will be actively seeking that out and also downloading with Caltrans what we can do to improve our application for ATP. And then also just want to thank you for your programming of the um, consultants to help us with those active transportation grants. I believe that's something that you include in your work program and I think it's helpful to um, the local jurisdictions as we look for construction funding or competitive funding for all of these projects. We have made some ways, um, some progress in our electric vehicle charging project. Um, we can't take credit for that work. We have to give all of that credit to COG, who's been really helpful in providing their on-call transportation planner to us, who I believe is near completion on environmental. It's such a small project that the 7,000 that we have identified there, actually we need all of it for the design and construction phase of that project. So the transportation planner for COG has picked up the environmental piece along with our contract planner at the city. Uh, so I think that's all that I have to give you an update on, unless there's any questions you guys have for me on the progress of our projects. Any questions? No? Any public questions? No? Okay, Thank just in the nick of time. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> Moving on to item number 17. we got about seven minutes. Hopefully we can cram this in seven minutes. Transit quarterly report. Amber. Yes, I will pass this on to CTA staff, uh, Melissa Reggio. Thank you. Um, as you'll see when we get to the CTA agenda that we have evaluated, I know previously we had reported that we are, you know, we picked up this funding from Calvers Transit. We've been evaluating these projects, seeing where they are and um, we are proposing new projects and new programming in the CTA uh, agenda. So, do you have any other questions? Any questions? No? Public? No? Okay, moving on to B. Oh. Yes, sorry, it's, it's, my apologies. Yes. I, I yes, I'll take this item. <laughs> Uh, I was looking at Erin to see if she could turn on the uh, projector. Um, this is the semi-annual performance report for Calaveras Transit. Um, it's been a goal of us uh, CTA staff uh, to provide timely performance reports in order to evaluate the system in time to make changes as we go along here. So this is, uh, I wasn't able to provide this to you, my apologies, before the meeting, so um, I included I believe everybody has a copy um, that we provided tonight, and there's some on the, the rostrum there for the public. Um, so I'll just walk through kind of the tables and we can have a discussion. 
um, about where we're at. Um, uh, before we start, um, how long do you think this is going to take to go through it? Should we just table it, take a five minute break, go into CTA, and then come back? Or do you want to go forward? Uh, what is this? I can make it five minutes long. <laughs> we can go fast. It's probably good to have this before the CTA meeting. Yeah. I'll say this is the last well, it is, but I, I item. Break through halfway through. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is the, uh, all the data shown in here is six months from July 1st to December 31st. Um, we've included comparisons of the first six months of the last two fiscal years there as well. Um, so this is just a standard operating statistics. Um, I think you'll see here vehicle service hours and miles which we refer to as revenue hours and miles when um, passengers are actually able to ride the system um, has reduced just slightly. And this is really just um, from the Delta Gold Line, which was a service to Stockton, was eliminated in fiscal year 18. Uh, and then this year we implemented uh, with the Saturday service we suspended it for three months and made it a seasonal service, so I think that's where you kind of see a, a slight reduction in vehicle service hours and miles. Um, operating costs and expenses, I wanted to point out um, at mid-year, we've included what we should have for operating costs um, at mid-year. It's not our budget to actuals because um, we wanted to include the true kind of six-month uh, operating costs of expenses that should be incurred. Um, there, but you can see it's about a 20% uh, decrease from the previous two fiscal years. And then revenue here, we didn't have the previous two fiscal years um, data for that six month period exactly, so you, you can't see a comparison there. Uh, moving on to uh, service effectiveness measures, um, we're showing here ridership, and you can see that ridership has really kind of remained stagnant. We're at about 19,000, 20,000, 19,000. Um, so for the first six months, I think it's expected that ridership would continue on the trend that it was, um, on the path that it was headed. Um, you know, although the CTA took over um, and we did implement some uh, minor service changes in September, um, I don't think, you know, we've expected that to turn the system around immediately. I think um, this long time trend I believe fiscal year 17 was the lowest ridership had been in the last 10 years um, for the transit system, and I believe it's about 60% less than it was 10 years ago. Um, so we're really at a very low point right now, and we have a lot of work to do, and we know that, um, and we knew that when we formed um, the transit agency, and that's why this year we've been working really hard on a really comprehensive approach on every aspect of the system here. Um, Passengers per vehicle service hour and per mile are pretty similar, although passengers per vehicle service mile has increased by 3.6%. It's not significant because you see it increase from 0.12 to 0.13 um, in one fiscal year. And then average daily ridership has stayed pretty much the same. I mean, you're looking at one uh, person per day difference between the fiscal years. So very, um, you can tell not much has, has changed in the last three fiscal years. Uh, moving on to um, looking at ridership by route, it, you know, we wanted to dig in a little bit deeper into the ridership numbers um, to see if there were any significant trends on any routes. Um, for the red line and blue line, you see between uh, fiscal year 17 and 18, there were kind of significant changes there, and that's when um, the county moved, kind of redesigned those routes. So the blue line used to go from Arnold to Columbia and the red line just from Valley Springs to Angels, and now the red line goes all the way to Columbia, and the blue line just goes between Arnold and Angels. So you kind of see the shift between the two routes, but the, the numbers are essentially the same. Um, but the red line is our bread and butter, um, and Columbia College is um, the largest ridership group for us. So when you see shifts in that, you're think, you know, we tend to think, okay, there's something happening with Columbia College, either they're offering um, fewer classes, there's less enrollment, or we need to do more outreach and partnership with them um, on education to their student population. So uh, staff is actually working right now on some partnership, partnership opportunities um, for a student uh, pass program 
Um, so we're excited about that, and hopefully that'll make improvements to that red line. Um, the, pur the purple line goes all the way to Jackson, and we just extended it to um, the Sutter Hill Transit Center um, in September. And so a, a slight reduction in that is showing me that we need more education and outreach on um, what that line provides for people to see if we can, we can improve that line. And then the Saturday Hopper did well because in October um, we were able to serve two different um, events that went on and that was really successful. Moving on to service efficiency measures. Um, this one we're really excited about. Uh, staff has been, uh, this has really been a focus of us to kind of get the cost under control for the transit system. So here you see at mid-year we are making huge strides um, in terms of reducing operating costs per vehicle service hour. And that's something we've been trying to tackle the last several years um, in terms of being able to provide more service for the same or less cost. And so this is a huge uh, performance measure for us and we're headed in the right direction. Um, fare box recovery ratio, let's discuss this. So here at, at mid-year, um, this is a very conservative estimate. We're showing 8.1%. And I think, you know, some of the things we talked about in the audit um, with Calaveras Transit, this 8.1% is the raw fare box recovery ratio in terms of our operating cost and, and really conservative estimate on our revenues. Um, it doesn't account for if we sold the surplus bus, um, it, depreciation, what um, Transit was also able to do, which is a good thing um, the last couple of years is exclude operating costs for services that were new. And you can exclude operating costs for new services for three years. And we're, we're done with those three years. So uh, this year the transit system won't be able to exclude any operating costs. Um, so you'll see that hit this fare box recovery ratio this year. But this is, you know, I think uh, ridership and fare revenue is obviously um, a large piece of the system and, and our focus point when we did the rebranding and this marketing effort um, will be huge for us this year, but um, we'll be focusing a lot on seeing if we can get this up by the end of the, the fiscal year. Uh, so conclusion here, I think there's pros and cons. Obviously, um, the negative of this performance report is we're still, you know, headed um, on a kind of somewhat downward trend. Um, but the positive is that we're getting costs under control. We're collecting our revenues um, that we can, we have control over collecting. Um, we're really focusing on, like I said, a really comprehensive approach this year. Um, if you see that bullet list down towards the bottom of that page, it just shows a few things that we're focusing on. So. Um, essentially executing a comprehensive marketing campaign with the rebranding effort, improving our relationships and coordination with partner agencies like CalWorks purchases a lot of tickets um, from us for their clients. Um, Columbia College is a huge partner that we need to focus on. So focusing on those partnerships with agencies who um, are huge contributors to our system is really important. Um, increasing outreach and education of our services obviously um, a lot of the issues people just don't know about our service or what they what we do or that we go three four quarters a mile off route and we can pick you up um, or that we go to Sutter Hill Transit Center and connect to Sacramento so um, that's going to be a big push this year with the rebranding and the marketing campaign um, improving customer experience and access you'll see in the CTA agenda um, we'll be approving or we'll be asking for the council to approve um, an agreement with token transit which is a mobile ticketing application, so things like that um, to improve, make it easier for people to write our system. Uh, managing operating expenses and improving efficiencies. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we're doing this. Um, and one you'll see in the CTA agenda with the operations contract is a big, big piece of our operating expenses. Um, collecting our revenues in a timely manner, that's been a huge issue last several years. And thanks to Melissa, um, we are doing well and she's being very forward thinking um, and, and looking out for us uh, so we don't go in, into the red. Um, and then update to the short range transit plan which will do rider surveys and really look at um, demographic changes 
and provide a comprehensive five-year uh, financial capital and operations plan for us. So that will be really big for us this next year. Um, and that's my summary of the performance report. Happy to answer any questions. Was that five minutes? I think I did uh, very well. Yeah, was that ten? Okay. <laughs> All right, good job. Okay. I tried. Nice <laughs> work. Well, it's, it's part of the CTA anyway, so that's fine. Uh, any council questions? I'm just uh, one needing a one minute break to talk to Josh before so he can take off. Before what? Before we start our next. Okay. You would like a break? One minute. Yeah, I need a break to talk to him too. Um, any other questions? Any public questions on this item? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gary Caldwell, Valley Springs. Um, one of the things I, I mentioned before. Uh, is to take out a big ad in the local paper that says pick up and drop off at your doorstep or something like that because you have route deviation you can do. So th for those people who say I can't walk down to the bus stop or I can't ride my bicycle down there or I don't have transportation to get down there, we'll pick you up at your front porch and it doesn't cost any more. The other thing I was going to say is you need to give some people a taste of the transit system. Now, uh, at least coming up soon, there will be uh, events going on in Murphy's, and I realize, Mr. Chairman, it's not your district, but there will be events going on up in Murphy's, uh, Irish Days, President's Day, that people uh, could use a ride possibly from, say, Angels up to uh, Murphy's, and it's so difficult to park in Murphy's, I don't know if you've been there at the most recent events, it's really tough to park. So if they could get a ride up there to the event, whatever the event might be, I think that would be good just to get them familiar with the system. And there are a lot of people who were hesitant to try BART and because they thought it was too cumbersome and uh, it took more time and, and more trouble than they wanted to uh, get involved in. But I think you may have a similar situation where people don't want to ride public transit because it's too cumbersome, too difficult to comprehend the system, so forth, but give them a free ride up to Murphy's. And you can do that. You have the authority to, the board has the authority to do that. So that would be my suggestion. Give them a taste, take out an ad that says, we will pick you up at your front door and we will drop you off at your front door. And that should hopefully uh, increase ridership, I would hope. It doesn't necessarily increase your fare box return, but it'll certainly increase ridership and maybe those who, who do try it may become paying customers in the future and who knows. Thank you. Gary, I think you dropped something or you knocked it off the pedestal there. All right, we will take a just a two minute break here before we go into CTA. I think it goes on here. Yeah. We're going to adjourn as the, as the COG and we're going to convene as the CTA, Elder Transit Agency. So, moving forward, um, I guess we're going to call to order. And then we're going to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance again. Okay. Really? Hopefully this time we get right. Uh -oh. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And that's why we were doing it again. <laughs> you got it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on to the consent agenda. Hey, can you guys? Uh, can you, thank you. Consent agenda items are expected to be routine and non controversial and will be acted upon by the council at one time without discussion. Any council member, staff member, or interested parties may request that an item be removed from the consent agenda for further discussion. Does any uh, council member wish to pull an item? Any staff member wish to pull an item? Any member of the public? 
Seeing none, we'll come, come back to ask for a motion. So moved. We have a motion. Second. second. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 7 0. Moving on to the regular agenda public comment. Five minutes per person. Comments shall be limited to items that are within the subject matter of jurisdiction of the council and not on the posted agenda. This is government section code 54954.3A. Is there any public comments? Seeing none, we'll move on to item number six. This is a resolution number 19 6 in public hearing to adopt the Calabria Transit Agency's Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, Paratransit Compliance Plan. I guess, I guess we should open the public hearing. Public hearing is now open. Is there any public comments on this item? Seeing no public comment, I will close the public hearing, bring it back to the council. Mm -hmm. This is an action item. So moved. And second. A motion and a second. Any other conversation? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7 0. Moving on to item number seven. This is a minute order approving the Calaveras Transit Agency or the CTA fiscal year 2018 19. Operation Budget Amendment Number Two. Melissa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as stated, this is the Budget Amendment Number Two. Um, the main reason for this amendment um, was to update based off mid-year. Um, as you can see in the expenditures, if you look at the chart, it's um, 7A on packet number 40, page 46. Um, line item 5480, gas and oil. Um, in the budget to actuals on the consent agenda, it is tracking a little high for what we had budgeted. So staff is recommending um, increasing that line item to 130,000. Um, and in our previous budgets, we had not identified the um, advertising revenue. So if you look on line item 4713, this was a conservative um, estimate, so we updated that item to 10,000. Mm -hmm. And then at mid-year, um, we had interest at approximately 32,000, so we increased that line item. So we budgeted revenue on line item 4,300 to $6,000. If the council has any questions. Um, the other thing I would like to add is when we increased line item 5480 gas and oil, if you'll remember at the previous um, budget amendment, we had more revenue to expenses by approximately $50,000. So even though we've increased the expenses, we still have the budgeted revenue within the budget. Okay, all right, that's my question. Thank you. So Chair, uh, thank you. Uh, the question is, is that uh, having just come out of the uh, Treasury meeting last week, is as interest rates are running on average about 2.4% overall uh, and is expected to remain flat, that they're not looking at the Fed increasing the rates, et cetera. Um, I would trust that if we uh, plug a number in for interest in the future that we look to what the, the, uh, the pooled rate would be and use that as our guide. Um, because I know that it's going to be a fairly stable number over the next 12 months, just looking at what the numbers look like. Yeah. So to see the additional interest is not a surprise, yeah. but um, it indicates that we probably were sh a little bit short on what we thought would happen. Yeah. And so it's nice to see. It is nice to see. Um, I was kind of surprised. And then if you looked, you know, if you noticed in the COG packet on all of our um, budget um, summary sheets, we got a lot of interest with RSTP and PTMI and CA, so we did pretty good. Um, I usually typically don't budget interest, you know, in the mm -hmm. COGS operations budget. I've never budgeted interest. I let that keep going into the fund to give it that um, padding or room. Um, but with CTA, I definitely, I mean, $6,000 for the transit system is. So <coughs> That's why I suggest to have this conversation is because we need to start thinking about it as a 
as a budgeted item. I mean, 2.4% versus 1% is a substantial change in our overall budget performance. So uh, I would just ask that we look at it as a serious piece of budget, just not throw a number in there because okay. we thought this is what it's historically been year over year. Let's not let's not go that direction. Let's uh, think ahead and, and look to what, and I'm sure that uh, our uh, uh, Rebecca can help to put that number together for you okay. so that you, you can see what it is because she is part of that treasure pool as well. All right, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Uh, how, do we, how do we purchase our fuel? Is it a, do we have like a, a, a group thing that we, we, we go and we purchase fuel from somewhere or we get it shipped to us? No, you know the FN? Um, CFN? CFN right. on uh, Cool Station Road. Okay. Um, we have an account with them and their account um, headquarters is in Sacramento. So we have gas cards for all the drivers. And so they fuel up right there. And then uh, uh, CTA staff and the operating staff get an email and then we reconcile all the invoices. Is, it, is the, the price we're paying for fuel, is it constantly a changing thing or do we lock in for a certain amount of time? Oh, it's not locked in. It's never. It's, it's always it's it's always it. fluctuating. <laughs> yeah, that would Is it just like a, you know, when you pull in by gas in your car? Yeah. Well, I mean, if, you know, working at the transit facility in New Jersey, we were buying it in bulk, so I wasn't sure how this works. If, it, if we get it at a cheaper rate than the average consumer does, or, or we looked at that in the past, especially with PTMI SCA funding at one point. We had programmed a project to get a gas tank and buy in bulk, but because of environmental and all of the situation, double up the tank, yeah, uh, liability on the county because it would be stored here, um, we didn't uh, pursue okay. that project any further. So there's no real way to necessarily reduce that fuel cost. Um, Probably the term. only good news is that San Andreas historically actually has some of the cheapest prices around. I mean, you can get gas here. Yeah, I, can, I buy it when I come down here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, I would but assuming as an agency, we're not paying the tax either. either. No, because we, with our tax ID. We're carbon yeah. Okay. And yeah. to that point, to continue that discussion is because I had a sta um, I had 400 vehicles in my fleet. Is is that you? You really need to have a big bulk purchase through Wright Express or, or CFN to really make it worthwhile. So we're not even close to the thresholds that they would want uh, to, to discuss any kind of a price point break. Uh, even with 400 vehicles, I was having trouble <laughs> finding price point breaks. So we just need to keep it in mind that they are, they're dealing with the environmental regulations, they're dealing with all the other side costs that we don't have to deal with, but we are getting a substantial discount in exchange. So, And they're also great at record keeping. They do a much better job at it than uh, most of your standard suppliers would do. And if we bought in bulk in a tank, now you've got a security issue too. So that's, I'm just glad we're doing it the way we're doing it. Any other Thanks for answering. Questions? Any public comments, questions, this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. For a motion. So moved. Second. And a second. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 7 0. Moving on to item number eight. This is a minute order approving the revised public transportation modernization improvement and service enhancement program account, the PTMISEA. Say that quick. <laughs> <laughs> program expenditure plan. Melissa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I stated in the staff report, the top shaded area of this expenditure plan or the spreadsheet are the projects that have been previously completed. And then these last five are what we identified um, with the remaining funding from the Calaveras Transit Agency. And then CTA staff last year um, you know, worked with the PTMISDA program and there was additional funds available. So we turned in the project for the two new buses and we received the 211,000 in July of this year. So we have you know, the 559,000 for these remaining projects. Um, the AVL project is underway and almost complete. Um, with the new branding and marketing, um, we're gonna be ordering the new signs 
um, and we're going to be wrapping uh, the vehicles. Um, like I said, we're ordering the two new uh, Ford buses, and then um, we have the remaining uh, $255,000 um, to work on bus stops. Um, we've been working with the local jurisdictions on viable uh, bus stop improvements. Um, Amber's been working with uh, Josh and Melissa, and so um, we'll continue with that and get these projects off the shelf. Any council questions, comments? Any public comments, questions? I, I actually do have a question. The the wraps we're talking about here, this is to make all our buses have this logo on there, correct? Yeah. Did this company advise anyone that El Dorado Transit has the same exact colors as this bus? Advise the company that's doing the wraps aren't isn't the company that did the marketing. Yeah, but did they even mention that to anybody? Because I don't ever recall them telling us that there was another agency, like right next to us, essentially that has those same colors. Well, I, I, yeah, I think. I when, mean, they're not. I mean, we're not ever going to run into each other, but it just. Well, when we were doing the rebranding effort, I mean, that was a big discussion, you know. And we're not unique, and we didn't come up with anything brand new. I mean, everything in terms of the names from colors to logos, you know, has been done. So it, you know, it's quite difficult for a transit agency to come up with a unique name. Even Connect is being utilized by various transit agencies throughout the United States. Okay. Um, so, you know, we said Calaveras Connect and these colors resonated with our local um, environment. And I think that's, that's where we're headed. And I, yeah, I agree. I mean, those colors are utilized not just other transit agencies throughout the United States, but a, a lot of businesses. That's not necessarily you know. a bad thing. Recognition no, is recognition. Nice. If the color scheme is, if somebody recognizes it because they've relocated or in this area, then that's a positive. You're right. Any other comments, questions? That was all. Any public comments or questions on this side? If not, bring it back. Looking for a motion. So moved. Motion and a second. Call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's a 7 0. Moving on to item number nine, a submitted order approving the California Office of Emergency Services to Cal OES programming in the amount of $30,365. Melissa, you got us 30 grand. <laughs> <laughs> this is the remaining uh, $30,000. So the original apportionment was the 36,697. Um, the Calaveras Transit Agency utilized the 7,700 on bus stop lighting. So the remaining actually was the 28,9, but because of interest, now we have 30,000. <laughs> um, so with this security funding, um, these are the four projects that we're looking at: um, the electric security gate, um, facility security system, and cameras. Um, a repeater, the repeater uh, radio tower service, and then the security cameras that actually go on the buses. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Melissa, we're not going to see any more extensions on this, right? Um, oh. <laughs> not if uh, Melissa has anything to do with it. She's okay. been really good at tracking this funding and, and we're moving as fast as possible right now to, to expend these funds. Thanks. Yes, yeah. but this funding right here does expire March 31st. So I have to extend it for one year to buy these four items. And then it will be done. Yes, then we'll be done. And I'll have to see it again. Yes. Okay. And then that radio repeater service will have to find an alternate funding source for it. Yes. Okay. Or alternate technology to replace Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other council questions, comments? Any public? Seeing none, bring it back to the board for a motion. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Passes 7 0. Moving on to item number 10. Again, this is a minute order approving amendment number one of the professional services agreement with the paratransit services for the operation and management of Calaveras Transit. This is not Melissa, this is Amber. Yes, I will take this item, thank you. 
Uh, in March of 2018, the county, um, while they were operating the, the transit system, entered into a service agreement with paratransit services um, for the personnel and services for the operation of the transit system. Um, that first year of the agreement that was through uh, April 2nd, oh sorry, March 31st of 2019, um, with two option years um, subsequent to that. And uh, the CTA has been assigned that contract starting on July 1st of 2018. So that contract goes till the end of March of this year. Um, so staff in our first six months of operation of the program has really looked thoroughly um, at the operating costs and the efficiency of the system. And we've identified a lot of um, changes to the operations contract that will be necessary um, to accomplish some of the um, efficiency improvements that we're looking for. We also worked really closely um, with paratransit services to identify a lot of things in the contract that might be restricting them um, from addressing or issues or making changes. So um, we worked with them um, and negotiated a nine month extension um, through Decem December 31st of 2019 um, at the current rate, which um, the first option year in the existing contract was an increase of $43,000. Um, so we really worked um, in partnership with paratransit and I really want to thank paratransit services staff for coming to the table to work with us um, on controlling the cost for this next year. And then um, staff will then move forward with uh, development of an RFP um, for a new operations contract. And um, it's a pretty extensive process. It's um, and looking at other jurisdiction takes anywhere between six to nine months um, from you know start to finish. Uh, Caltrans requires review of the RFP, then they require review of your evaluation of proposals and the contract so that you have to work into um, the schedule there. So um, nine months will give us the time we need to um, put together a new contract. We've already um, evaluated with paratransit services and, and uh, CTA staff the things that need to be changed in the contract. So um, we are prepared to move forward uh, with that process if the board approves this amendment. Yeah, that, that's good to hear because, as you know, when we first took this over, we, we had a problem. We had to do something really quick because we were out of amendments um, to these contracts. So okay. yeah, we need to aggressively go forward on it so we don't end up there again. Um, and it wasn't us. I know it was the county, but it was still the transit authority. So uh, the question would be, uh, uh, Amber, you're going to bring bounce this off the executive management group before you bring it before the full board, the RFP? Uh, yeah, so the RFP doesn't typically go to the full board. No, but I uh, just would ask that they have an opportunity to take a look at it before it moves forward. Yeah, absolutely, I can do that. Okay. Yeah. Any comments, questions? Any public comments or questions? Mr. Chairman, Gary Caldwell, Valley Springs. I was looking at the agreement and of course, I don't like these one-year agreements because you're always on the downside before you know it. And I think you should be looking at entering into an agreement that's like five years with uh, a 60-day either party, 90 days, doesn't matter to me, adequate notice to terminate the agreement without cause. And in that five-year uh, period, you build in agreed to and negotiated increment increases so that the paratransit doesn't think, well, wait a minute, we're going to have to live with these rates for five straight years? I don't want to do that. So have some sort of a stepped increase, and at least the contract will go for some time because, like I said, before you realize it, you're going to be negotiating the next one. And I think that's a waste of everybody's time. Anyway, that's my suggestion. And I can just assure the board uh, it is our full intent to make this contract a, a long-term agreement with multiple long-term um, option years. And, and I, the board is aware 
uh, as to why this contract was this is a, was a stopgap was developed it, so the short. previous contract I believe was three years but they had amendments to it to get extended and then you can only go with so many exceptions uh, so this was something we had to do really quick because we were out of time and the idea was we specifically went into it with a one year so this board or this council could come back and, and get back going and find out what's going on we can work into it but I think we are looking at long-term contracts so again. So now you have to correct that oversight? Correct. Do it right. Yeah. Okay, any other comments, questions? If not, I'm looking for a motion. So moved. A motion to have a second. Second. I have a second. Um, call for vote, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7 0. Moving on to item number seven, 11, excuse me. In an order authorizing the executive director to execute a software and subscription services agreement with Token Transit for mobile ticketing. Again, this is Amber. Yes, my apologies. You get to hear from me a lot tonight. Um, Calaver Transit uh, currently is a cash based fare system. So if you want to ride the bus, you either have to get on board the bus and you have to have exact cash exact change um, to ride or, or purchase a ticket or you have to go to Pool Station Road um, where our customer service center is and purchase a ticket there with cash or check um, and we don't accept credit cards. Um, unless your Cal works and you order bulk uh, ticket books for their clients. Um, so this is one area that um, we really looked a lot into and did a lot of research um, on what we can do to make it more accessible for people. Um, there's, you know, a lot of urban systems have the electronic fare systems where you have a card that you can refill. Um, those require pretty extensive capital investments um, in the fare infrastructure on board the buses, as well as then the, the uh, purchasing software that you need for that system. Um, and then also, you know, the other option is online uh, credit card, like PayPal, or things like that, um, but we're missing kind of a gap there in terms of, okay, when a person purchases a ticket on online, how do we get them the ticket? Uh, you know, so we would have to come up with a mechanism for that. But now with all the new mobile apps and technology, um, there's actually some very specific um, companies that are coming to the table that are, are specific for transit uh, mobile ticketing apps. Um, so this one company called Token Transit, um, they're currently, uh, they're kind of blowing up right now um, and they serve 59 agencies nationwide um, and they're increasing their customer base um, and they provide a mobile ticketing app uh, that you go on, you can purchase your ticket and then you just show literally the phone to the driver. So we don't need to um, incur any capital expenses or maintenance costs, it's just literally their cell phone and the training for the drivers is extremely minimal. I mean, we just have to um, show them what that, that app looks like. Um, and if you can see on the picture, kind of the graphic I put um, on page 60, uh, it's really simple. I did it, I went to um, Stockton a couple weeks ago and they have token transit. So I went on, I, from, you know, I just downloaded the app. You put in your, phone, your cell phone number and you're done and then you go to p purchase a ticket. Now they have Apple Pay and it picked up my credit card and it said, okay, and put your thumbprint on it and boom, I had my ticket. So it was super easy. And I did that a whole night before because I didn't know the system very well and it made it really easy. So we think, um, you know, this won't replace the cash-based fare system. We'll still have all of our existing options for purchasing passes. Um, this will just be an added element um, this will be good for encouraging visitors to ride our system, especially for the Saturday hopper service. Um, so we, we don't expect, and, and you know, we reached out to a lot of agencies that have this uh, service and they're very happy with it. Um, and it hasn't impacted their fair revenue because you know, it's not like on day one then everybody switches over to this app. I think it'll be just utilized by certain people um, and we'll have to advertise for it. So the contract is a commission based system so they'll get um, I think here I said between 7 and 10 percent depending on uh, the exchange so if it's below two dollars I think they only take seven percent and if it's above two dollars they take ten percent um, of whatever sold on the app so if nothing's sold on the app they don't get paid um, 
So it's, it provides an incentive for Token Transit to keep improving the app, and then we get the benefits from those improvements. Like I said, they just uh, had it initiate an agreement with Apple Pay, and, and then you know everybody, all the transit agencies who have Token Transit benefit from that. So I open up to any council questions. So we're going to get paid in real time, or is there a delay? I'm referring to like the square and some of those others where there's 24-hour delays or? Yeah, I don't believe we'll get paid in real time on the app. I think it's 24, yeah. 24 hours? Yeah. That's still not bad. Okay. And they'll provide the accounting for the payments that they make? And the support? Correct, yeah, okay. the support. Do you foresee a time where the use of the app and the fee that we're being charged per use reaches a level where it starts to hurt us? I don't foresee that at this time. You know, I'm kind of considering this a, a one-year test trial for us. Um, if it, I'm hoping that this only increases our ridership. You know, people who wouldn't otherwise ride because, you know, it's too difficult and this might make it easier for them to access the system. But we'll, we'll keep monitoring and, and see the impacts of this. Um, but I don't anticipate that. I, I still anticipate the people who are riding right now will probably use a lot of the same avenues to get passes. I, I just asked the question because a lot of times you set up things for credit cards and whatnot, and then all of a sudden at the end of the year, like, oh my God, the fees are killing us. So. Right. Yeah, and the, the other agencies we spoke to said it doesn't have an impact because not everybody has shifted over. So it's a really small portion of people who are using the app right now. How are you going to market this? Uh, well, luckily, um, I think this is really good timing with our rebranding and marketing campaign that we're kicking off. Um, so we'll incorporate that into all of our marketing materials. Um, and it's really good timing right now. Um, upon us approving this, how long is it going to take for this to be active? Um, I'm hoping by next week. Okay. Yeah. So my goal is by the kickoff of Saturday service on the 16th. Yeah, I have a couple of questions on indemnity. Um, Did you I read the indemnity clause here. Um, one, it doesn't measure, mention this council. It says customer. And two, um, given the fact it's all electronics, and they're relatively new to what you said, but they're, they're breaking out. It opens up a door where they could be hacked and steal information from everybody that's using their app, which would pull the indemnity clause in. Um, just something to bring up and think about. Um, I prefer when we do contracts under indemnity that it states the old council um, itself. Uh, something like the customer is not, uh, I just have, doing contracts, I, I just have an issue somewhat with that. Do you know? Um, if somebody hacks into them and steals any, all the information from people that have used their app, because they're going to be giving a credit card to this company or however their payments are set up for it, um, we could sue. And I think individual, although county council or county council will have to defend us, we would, could be individually named um, as a party to it. So um, I, I see they signed this contract. Uh, when you go back to them, if we could maybe change this indemnification clause to include the council members okay. being indemnified. Um, Did Jim look over this contract? Yes. Yeah, and, we, and Jim had actually quite a few changes that they accepted, so I was happy about that. And he's not here tonight, so. Right. Yeah, so my apologies. But I'm. I hear what you're saying here. I just looked at, you know, ca customers identified in the first page as the Calaveras Transit Agency, which I assume is inclusive of all of us. Yes, but it doesn't mean that in a lawsuit, the lawyer can say we're going to sue us all individually, too. I, I'm telling you. Okay. His point's valid. Been there. Like when you pull up, <laughs> you get insurance or something, you're going to work on a county pro or state property. It says the state of California, its officers, elected officials, and employees. And I've had most other agencies that work since I came 
that, change Mountain Valley EMS, LAPCO, and everything else has changed any contracts that make that statement, so we're protected. Okay. Um, and I would like to see CTA in here, not just customer CTAs in it. So that specifically spells it out. Because um, it could happen. I, I know these guys are expanding quickly, and who knows. So. Okay. Okay, that's my comments. Any other comments, questions? Any public comments, questions? If I understood correctly, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the council is going to be paying somebody to be able to use these various forms of payment. Is that correct? No. No, not specifically. No, when if you use this app, you go on. You want to use transit. You don't pay for that use? They will, they will take, deduct it from the they will deduct it from the revenue they collect. So, so in a way, I guess what you're saying is true. We are paying, but it's a very small amount. You said 7%, and if it's seven under, And it affects, uh, so it's seven cents on a dollar. It affects your bottom line fare box return, I assume, however minuscule it might be. It, it can, but it can also up the bottom line, too. If more people use an app and being able to are riding it. Of course, I'm of the dinosaur age. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if uh, you got hundreds of thousands of dollars of, and I can never remember the acronym, PT, whatever it is. Oh, PMT, I mean, it's yes. Yeah, <laughs> to improve bus stops and bus shelters. Why not buy an ATM? You know, if you go to New York and you go to the Port Authority building, they got vending machines there. And I'm sure other cities have them too. Where you stick a $10 bill in and they give you the right uh, fare, you know, to get on the whatever direction you want to go. And uh, what comes to my mind is that if you lay out your bus stops such that you can utilize the wall of a building perhaps, maybe, or if not, it could be freestanding like the one is in the Valley Springs Shopping Center there. It's a freestanding ATM. I'm, I'm wondering why you can't buy it or is it prohibited from buying an ATM? I realize that you see these pictures on television where the pickup truck drives up, throws a chain around it and drags it off, but those are few and far between, I think. And um, don't pay anybody. The machine will be paid for, hopefully, with uh, federal funds. The ones you, the person you pay is the guy who reloads the, the uh, ATM every once in a while. And that's it. You know, it's the old story. It's other people's money. That's what you use. Yeah, but you're now you're incurring a 2 to $3 cost on the passenger by using that ATM, generally, unless we waive the fee. I'm sorry, what? Generally, if you use an ATM, it charges you a fee, a service fee. And a person taking public transportation, having to spend 2 or $3 on that service fee is almost the cost of their fare t for the bus. So they'd be essentially buying two f bus fares for one ride. And well, I don't I, think those individuals could afford to That's dependent do upon that. what you negotiate with your bank. We went to Europe. We use the ATM machines all the time. Never paid any transaction fees. But we arranged that before we went with B of A, who said, we'll waive all the fees. You guys were pro I mean, you have to use. The individuals possibly using our transportation might not be as um, savvy as that. Might not be what? As uh, technically, technologically savvy to do that. <laughs> I, oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> I'm just saying. All right, any other public comments? Seeing none, bring it back to the board. Looking for a motion? I would make the motion with a modification, as you recommended, to, to include the individuals uh, named in it. Um, and uh, that would CTA be the and yes. council. Correct. Didn't have to name us, but the, the phrase you used, the, the elected phrase, officers, the phrase you the appointed office. officers. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Second. And then we have a second. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
passes 7 0. Moving on to item number 12, fiscal year 2018 19 mid year performance report. Yes, I provided this uh, performance report to the con board and now I'm prepared to provide it to the CTA board. Does the board wish to see it again? <laughs> Negative. But we could address uh, any questions from that report at this time if you'd like. Well, the only questions I had and, and that I saw, and it really wasn't much at all, is um, when we were looking at the ridership slide, um, and it's really not that significant, but um, we, we, we got rid of the Delta Gold Line and the Brown Line. And mid-year last year, there was 294 riders on that. Uh, the year before, there was 586. So, so if you really reflect up to mid-year of this year after that, it doesn't factor in that we, does that number 11,599, by 594 minus a 5.1 reflect us taking out those numbers? Um, You're comparing those numbers against other numbers. Right. 19, yeah, do you understand? So no, it doesn't account for that. I think just the narrative has to account for that saying, you know, so the, please take, okay, you know, so take into account there were additional routes in the previous fiscal years that so you know, had five, ridership that this year doesn't. Yeah, so the 5.1 really it is a hard number, but it's not reflecting that. Well, it's reflected down below that 5.1% only reflects on the red on line. A, on, on, you know, yeah, the 4.7 down below. So it really, it's reflected in the 4.7 because these are hard, these are all hard numbers. Yeah. Okay. Did I answer that incorrectly? Great job. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I would also hope that we keep our options open. Uh, as we see continued expansion in s certain uh, lines. I know copper is doing very poorly in relation to a lot of the other ones. However, uh, as the town square builds out 44 um, units of housing or hotel space, uh, that will drive more ridership, hopefully, to Murphy's. So we might be looking at the Saturday Hopper wanting to start at town square and, and run up to Murphy's or Arnold uh, rather than just look at it as a stop point of Angel's Camp. I think we could start picking up ridership, but uh, we start looking at those, those options as they come up. Yeah, and I absolutely agree. The service changes we did in September were really made to address immediate, um, mm -hmm. you know, scheduling gap issues um, and technical issues. Um, but we'll look to the Shoreline Transit Plan to really evaluate, um, you know, where there's development opportunities, um, expansion opportunities of the system. Um, where our demographic shifts have been um, and what major changes we need to make to the system. So we'll really look to that process to address new expanded areas. I'm glad to meet offline about it um, because I think that there are some opportunities, but they're not going to come immediately. It'll be six months to a year before we start to see the effect. And just so we're prepared, much like fire departments, some water districts, et cetera, to meet those demands. Because we have 172 units coming in uh, at Denovia Homes there in Copperopolis. We have 38 that are currently built in Lemke's Unit 2 there at La Cobra Mina. You start adding all those up, if they're even going to put another 40 or 50 homes into Saddle Creek, all of a sudden there's, there's that additional housing element that wasn't there before. So as long as we're prepared to meet the needs of the, of the population, and as it ages, especially in the Copperopolis area, um, it would be very helpful to get them into our other centers, which would be take them up to Angel's Camp to shop rather than having them try to find a way to Sonora. Right. So. Wasn't the Copper Line extended past uh, Copper Cove Drive all the way down to the end of Kiva too on Little John? On demand. On demand. Yes. So the marketing, getting people aware of the fact that they can get a bus now to Kiva, Little John intersection rather than having to go all the way up to Copper Cove Drive and pick up that whole subdivision back there. Sure. We'll talk more offline. Okay. I have a question. Um, with the ridership with the Saturday Hopper and the event coming up this year, are we going to expand out, still expand outside this Saturday and go for the entire event to see if we can pick up more ridership um, going into the new year? 
So we mean like President's Day weekend. Is it just going to be Saturday, or are we going to also accommodate the second day of the event as well? And how can we be flexible with doing that to help increase some of these numbers for the cost? Yeah, so so far we've only identified major key events like the fair, where we have a separate shuttle service for the fair. Um, and the Saturday service luckily captures a lot of that events in Murphy's, but um, that's something we haven't really considered. I think in the past when we've done a Sunday service, it hasn't been as successful um, as Saturday. Um, and right now with the Saturday service, you know, we really need to do a lot of work to market that service and make it successful because it's currently um, not surviving on its own. Yes. Uh, and that's why I was asking, you know, uh, the few events that go over multiple days other than the fair, is that a way to capture some of that? If it doesn't work, that's fine. I'm just asking what options are there. And maybe with the marketing, this is a good um, opportunity to test it and then say, okay, it didn't work. Let's move on and see what other options are for the Saturday Hopper to increase fares. Okay, yeah, we can look at other, I, we try to look at events that specifically covered, you know, multiple days, because um, the President's Day weekend, I guess it is the whole weekend, um, but, you know, typically at the beginning of the year, we'll kind of approve an events calendar okay. um, and have to advertise and promote it on our website. So for the for this year, we won't be able to do the Sunday of, of President's Day, but I appreciate what you're saying, and I think we'll take another look at the different events. Um, and maybe bring that back, you know, for council consideration. And that, that's, that's fine. I can see why it would be too soon. It's right around the corner. <laughs> yeah, and you know, we're really trying to focus on um, that improving the salary service right now because it's 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 not meeting its fare box recovery ratio on its own. You know, the county got to exclude it last year, um, so we're just we're really trying to market that Saturday service. This might be where event coordinators might um, be able to contribute a piece to the puzzle, so to speak. They might see the advantage and want to want to put some dollars towards having the additional service. And if it's a very defined service for their event, and they put some money towards it, they got a skin in the game, so they'll market it to some degree for us too. Uh, we haven't often thought about how how to put them into that game and, and get them involved. There, we're just. They're just kind of like the victim of the process that we put in front of them. And uh, we can change that up by simply letting them participate in that decision of the timing, because to them, the timing is critical. And if it doesn't meet their, their time windows, um, they're not gonna push it. So, just brainstorming. Any other comments? Any uh, public comments? Seeing none. This is an informational item. We'll move on to item number 13, the Paratransit Operations Report. Well, hello, hello. Cynthia Lawrence, Paratransit Services um, Operations Contract Manager. Um, so it looks like I'm covering November, December, and part most of January. So I'm trying to keep us sort of up to date. Um, so first I want to start off with 2018. We had an accident or what we call collision-free year, and we're actually running at 2.3 years of no preventable uh, collisions. Um, and that translates into 837,332 miles. That's a lot of mileage. We cover a lot of roads. Um, as you saw with the uh, weather and whatnot, we work really hard to minimize our exposure and our passengers' exposure to safety concerns with weather. Um, our drivers are um, awesome. They're very well trained. Um, we go through a series of training events throughout the year, um, teaching them, you know, reminding them of, tra of uh, chaining. We have some buses that have auto chains. They have very big limitations sometimes when you have this kind of crazy weather. Um, so I'm really happy to say with, with this last weather event, we didn't have any issue either. Um, so we still remain uh, accident collision free. Um, so we're gonna keep with that trend. 
Um, we did our on-time performances. Um, we've been doing really well. Um, and so we're going to continue on that. Um, we didn't have any route cancellations in these months. Uh, and then, of course, our outreach events. So the big um, stuff the bus events this year. We had a couple little challenges, um, one with the campfire. A lot of people were um, really focusing on taking care of the folks up, up there with the campfire. Um, and uh, we also had some weather issues that canceled uh, one weekend. So, but I'm still proud to say we did really well. Um, we collected um, 1,825 pounds of dry food, um, 1,540 pounds in turkeys and hams. Um, which is always great because um, that means that the less impact it has on the food bank and uh, $744 in cash. Um, we really enjoy our work with the, um, the people there at the food bank resource connection um, and they've been running short of hands around there and so we were glad that we could also add some additional help and we put out the red boxes for them and um, and just told them anything they needed. If we had the extra help, we were gonna be there for them. So they were able to get some additional um, items that way as well. Team member of the month. Um, I'm sort of happy about this part. We, I got my picture. Um, Dean Hunt, he, he is um, just an awesome guy. He came on board with us um, May of 2017. Um, and he is just a breath of fresh air. He comes in every day, gets his work done, has a smile on his face, and it's whatever it takes to get it done, I'm gonna do it. Uh, he's got a great attitude. Um, one of the things I just wanted to highlight, I said it in my report, and that is, is that our people are pretty awesome. They're very committed to our community, and Dean is no exception to that. He went out, um, he heard that this one uh, a passenger that rides with us was in need of a wheelchair, and despite all the efforts on that young man's, uh, uh, that that young man took to get another wheelchair, or get his re wheelchair repaired, he just could not do it. And uh, Dean went out and contacted some people he knew, and next thing you know, he shows up and he's got a wheelchair for this gentleman and took it to his house for him, delivered it for him. Um, and then he was, the young man had complained a couple times and he overheard him. He, he rides the bus to Columbia College a lot, so uh, he heard that uh, he was getting wet with all the weather and he hated that his legs were wet all day long. So I went out and found him a pair of uh, ski pants, keep his legs wet, nice and dry so he wouldn't get wet. So just little things like that um, just really make a huge difference in our community and the people that we serve. And, and I, I'm just so proud of him and the rest of our team. They, they do a great job every day, but he's our shining star for January. So if you have any other questions. Any council questions, comments? Oh, any public comments, questions? All right, Oof, I'm you. out of here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on to item number 14, staff reports. The liberal reports, no supplemental material included. Melissa, you have nothing? Amber? Um, okay, so I provided a staff report that uh, I'll try to provide on a quarterly basis for you. Um, and it details everything that we're working on. Um, I probably missed several different things, but it, it gives you the breadth of um, things that we're doing and kind of status of, of um, our efforts. Um, Saturday Hopper is starting up on President's Day weekend. You saw that flyer. Um, our rebranding effort is well underway and we're looking to hopefully impl implement that in the spring. So um, come March or April, but everything has to be timed out just right. Um, the new wraps, the signs, the new brochures. So everything has to be executed, um, you know, within a, a good week span together. So um, that'll take some uh, really close coordination. Um, uh, staff is currently working on a long-term reserve policy for transit. Um, we're looking at other agencies' reserve policies, and we'll bring that to the executive management group um, to bring to the full board um, in the at a future meeting. Um, capital projects, you heard an update on that. And then I provided an update on our advertising sales program, um, which is well underway. So we've sold all of the backs of the buses, um, all of, I think, uh, 
on the passenger side and so we just ha still have some spots available on the driver's side so um, this year we'll get I think we estimate about 10,000 that's conservative um, so hopefully we'll come out a little higher than that but next year hopefully will be a full year of um, full ad sales so I think it's it's looking good and that's it I won't read the rest verbatim this time uh, but if you have any questions on anything even after this evening if you look at anything um, please let us know any council questions or comments any public seeing none informational thank you Em. Aaron do you have anything of staff that you want to bring up or? Uh, not, at this time. not at this time okay then we'll move to adjourn as a CTA and we will re we'll reconvene as COG and we'll go back to where we left off we left off on item number 18 is council report. Any council member? Nothing to report. report. Nothing to report. Okay. No? Okay. I have a couple of things to say. Uh, Amber has. Um, Excuse me. Amber, I guess that was. <laughs> you. Oh, um, sorry. First, I want to introduce Amber. Alvin, even though he's been here through the whole meeting. Um, he now <laughs> will be joining us on both boards and our newly elected um, at the City of Angels. Uh, we also voted our vice mayor, and that will be Joe. Um, and then the thing going on around town is um, we, the last meeting I think we talked about Caltrans granting us um, to put our parking signs up for downtown Angels. Uh, the last council meeting for the city, I believe, we approved the design of that. Um, so staff is going ahead with the design that the council approved, which is a little bit different than um, what was originally approved because um, we had to make them taller and they weren't on the bump out. So part of the planning was for the bump out at the corner going, going downtown. Well, we haven't planned that, but we needed the parking sign. More. So we redesigned to um, fit the current um, sidewalk with the sign. So they'll be going up higher and there'll be one next to the visitors bureau and then one where Signal Service is now um, heading up towards Rag Bay Lane. Um, we finalized our city gate report and the council uh, at our next meeting. Um, We'll be um, reviewing the priorities that we have at the city um, due to our finance, uh, financial situation. And, um, but good things, uh, talk to supply getting started and um, they're moving. I see a lot of dirt out there. Um, Caltrans has agreed with everything they asked for their turning lane, so those are going really well. Um, to help that project go forward. And our next meeting, since it was canceled on Tuesday, um, is to be determined. So. Okay, yeah. Yep. So stay tuned. That's how's, all I have. How's your health care? You got a health care building being built. How's that coming along? Yeah, that's. I, it's they didn't get anything yeah. for. Yeah, especially with the weather. Behind, they started moving dirt, but that's okay. about as far as they got. Great, thank you. All, my, all, of my, all of my job sites are shut down. Yeah, everything's shut down. Yeah, I think a lot of Okay. Yep. Anyone else? If not, we move on to item number 19, staff reports. The verbal report, no supplemental materials included, except for 19A, which we do have some materials. Yes, as, as usual, I include a pretty comprehensive staff report on an update on all the projects that we're working on, uh, both planning and then the grant applications that we're working on uh, and an update on st state and federal um, legislative matters. So um, you can read at your leisure. Uh, but I'll just, uh, one thing to highlight in this report is um, we received $1.7 million in Highway Safety Improvement Program, HSIP, um, funding for the city and county, and that was a direct result of the 
systemic safety analysis report that the COG did uh, for the city and county and our consultant um, put together the grant application. So I think that was, uh, we put together four grant applications and got three um, awarded. So I think that was a good success from that process. And that is, those are my updates. That's your updates? That's it. Okay, any questions? No, good job. Uh, Melissa, you have a staff report or anything you want to talk about? No? Aaron? You're good again? All right. Well, with that, we stand adjourned. Um,